everybody. It is Saturday, which means it's time for a Stuff You Missed in History Class classic. Today, we are revisiting an episode from 2012 in the Sarah and Dublina era. It is on Mary Anning, who during her lifetime was nicknamed the Princess of Paleontology. So here we go. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dablina Chakraborty. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And researching this episode's topic really took me back to my childhood days, digging for artifacts, fossils, and the like in my backyard in small town Alabama. I mean, did you ever do this, Sarah? Did you look for treasures? I did. I did. And I don't think I ever came up with a whole lot more than old clay plumbing pipes. So, I mean, (laughs) at least that's something. Well, my friend Katie and I actually had um, a game that we made up. It was really a game, but we called it Archaeologist. And we would go to the trails behind my house and come back with these big clumps of dirt And then we would sit on my parents' deck with my dad's tools and, like, chisel at them and (laughs) pretend like we were finding things while we sang songs from the movie Beaches. Oh, wow. Yes. You must have been really excited (laughs) when Jurassic Park came out. I I was. I I liked the book. I read the book before it came out, and I was really excited about that movie. But, yeah, but, of course, in our little archaeologist game, we never— came up with anything, just piles of dirt. No dinosaur Which I'm sure my parents love. But the subject of today's podcast, Mary Anning also started hunting for fossils in her hometown in the early 1800s at a very young age, but she made out much better than most kids. Anning not only found many authentic fossils, she found entire skeletons of prehistoric creatures and is often considered a key player in the development of paleontology as a science. All of this happened even before the term dinosaur even existed. So she didn't even know exactly what she was trying to find with these, uh, what were certainly more than games. So in fact, she's been called, quote, one of the most accomplished fossil hunters of her time. And some scientists even believe her work may have contributed to the theories of Charles Darwin himself. But Mary Anning wasn't fossil hunting for the sake of science alone. And she wasn't just doing it for childhood kicks either, like like us, Blina. We're going to take a look today at what exactly motivated this prolific paleontologist and why if she's linked to the likes of men like Charles Darwin and other prominent scientists, her name isn't nearly as well known as you might expect it to be. First, though, we need to give you a little bit of background on where Mary Annie lived because it certainly gave her a distinct advantage as a fossil hunter. She was born and lived her entire life in a town called Lyme Regis on England's Channel Coast. In the late 18th century, this became a really fashionable resort area and has been featured in books including Jane Austen's Persuasion and John Fowle's The French Lieutenant's Woman. But according to an article by Michael A. Taylor and Hugh S. Torrens in Natural History, Way before it became a resort town, 200 million years ago, in fact, Lyme Regis, along with the rest of southern Britain, was submerged under tropical sea near the equator. So animals that died in those waters often ended up embedded and preserved in the mud of that submerged land. And that's why this region, the English Channel coast of southern England, known as the Jurassic Coast, has been so abundant in fossils. It just seems to have an almost never-ending supply of them. And Lyme Regis in particular is surrounded by cliffs composed of alternating bands of limestone and slate, which are constantly being eroded by the elements. And every time they are um, eroded a little bit more, they reveal all kinds of fossilized treasures. And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, the cliffs date from the late Jurassic to early Jurassic period, so about 229 million to 176 million years ago. So there's plenty of time to have stored up lots of fossils. So that's just a basic, not too sciencey snapshot of the area where Mary Anning was born, May 21st, 1799. And she was one of somewhere around 10 kids of a poor cabinet maker named Richard Anning and his wife, Mary Moore. Now, the Annings, I mean, which is part of why we don't exactly know how many kids they had, they had it pretty rough as far as their kids were concerned. Only two children, and that was Mary and her older brother Joseph, managed to survive. All the other children were lost to illness or accident along the way. And there was even another child called Mary before the Mary we're focusing on in this episode came around. 
And according to a 2005 article in British Heritage, our Mary, covered in this podcast, had a narrow escape of her own as a child. When she was only about a year old, she and her nursemaid got caught out in a pretty bad thunderstorm. And when the nursemaid took Mary and sought shelter along with a couple of other people underneath a big tree, the tree got struck by lightning and killed all the three adults underneath the tree and burned Mary pretty badly too. When Mary was found, in fact, everyone thought that she was dead too, but they managed to revive her. And according to her family, this event really changed their child somehow. She was considered, quote, dull before, but after, I mean, for a one-year-old, I'm not exactly (laughs) sure, but after this event, she became really intelligent and lively and grew up that way too. So to her family, it seemed like the lightning had changed the course of Mary's life, being struck by lightning. And as we mentioned earlier, around the time that Mary was born, Lyme Marie just started becoming a hotspot for vacationers, and that created a market for what were known as local curios or curiosities. Local townspeople would collect and peddle fossils for cash. In- this included fossil shells, which they called lady fingers, and stones that looked like pieces of backbone, which they called vertebraries. Mm, yum. Sounds like a new cereal. It does. <laughs> Most people involved in these sorts of transactions, of course, had no idea that the items were fossils. Tourists were just mainly buying them as souvenirs, tchotchkes kind of. Exactly. And Mary's father, Richard, was one of these amateur fossil collectors, and he would sell these curiosities to tourists, and it became a major source of income for his entire family. And Mary, of course, became pretty interested in these curios, too. She'd go along with her father sometimes, collecting fossils, collecting shells along the shores, and even climbing around the cliffs looking for things. And on these outings, Mary learned how to feel out her finds and carefully remove items that were lodged into the cliffs. So, Dublina, it sounds like you already know how to do this with your with your mud finds, you know, carefully removing things. I don't know things. about the cliffs part of it, though, Sarah. <laughs> I don't like heights. I'd probably just stay on the ground. But, I mean, even then, climbing around cliffs wasn't exactly the safest hobby you could have after all. And in 1810, Richard Anning actually had an accident while he was hunting for fossils. Some sources say that he fell from a cliff. Others say that he was caught in a rock slide. But either way, he died soon afterward. Mary was, of course, devastated, but she kept hunting for fossils like she would have anyway with her father, perhaps as a way to remember him. And then one day she sold a fossil, this kind of coiled shell known as a snake stone to a tourist, and it sort of lit a fire under her. She realized that her hobby could be lucrative. You know, she could help supplement some of that income her family had lost with the death of her father. They really needed money now more than ever. So she started to hit the beach even harder, looking for fossil finds in order to help support her family. And then in 1811, the year after her father's death, her brother Joseph found this huge skull on the beach, and he wasn't sure what it was exactly. It appeared to be kind of similar to a crocodile skull, and he showed it to Mary, who was 12 years old at the time. But according to that British Heritage article that we mentioned earlier, a mudslide covered their find before they could really do anything about it. About a year later, though, Mary rediscovered fossils in that area and excavated them, and it turned out to be the entire 17-foot-long skeleton of an ichthyosaurus, a prehistoric marine reptile that's kind of similar in the way it looks to a dolphin. Ichthyosaurus translates to fish lizard. According to Taylor and Torrin's article, this wasn't the first ichthyosaur to be discovered, but it did become the, quote, type specimen of the ichthyosaurus, the scientifically described specimen for which the genus was officially named. And as you can imagine, a find like that would command better prices than what you'd get from your average tourist. Better Mary, than shells. Definitely. Mary ended up selling this to Henry Host Henley, who was the chief property owner in the area for 23 pounds, which was a huge amount. It's the equivalent of several thousand pounds today. So for Mary's poor family, this was a huge deal. 
It took years of study for scientists to settle on exactly what Mary's find was, but it caused a lot of buzz in the scientific community and the religious community as well, because around this time, religion still had a very big influence on science. And scientists really tried to fit their findings into the Bible story of creation. So basically, the belief was that God had created the earth only about 6,000 years prior to this time, and everything had remained essentially unchanged since no and the flood. So there were all these animals and they all appeared on earth at the same time and they were all as they were. And as a result, for some time, people believe that fossils, such as even things like mastodon bones, were the remains of animals that still existed somewhere on the planet. But of course, as more fossil finds like Mary's came to life and the fossilized creatures became more and more exotic, like an ichthyosaurus, People finally had to start accepting the possibility that creatures could become extinct. And this is the part that many believe helped Charles Darwin make the case for natural selection by introducing the idea that some species could really disappear forever. Mary, though, wasn't coming at her work from the position of a scientist or even what was known as a, quote, gentleman collector. Her family largely depended on her finds to live, and so she continued to hunt for fossils pretty much every single day. But it was many years before she had another big find, and in the meantime, business was pretty spotty. Sometimes she wouldn't find much besides souvenir-level kind of stuff, and her family struggled, and at other times she made sales to private collectors and to museums and, and had a little bit of money. A lot of her best finds were in the winter because that's when the erosion made the most difference in what she could find. Probably not as many tourists around, too, I bet, picking up all the good stuff. True. So in the years before 1820, though, things really got so bad for the Annings. At one point, they were apparently selling furniture to pay their rent that a collector named Thomas Birch, who had purchased things from Mary, auctioned his collection and donated the proceeds to the Anning family. And this started a rumor that the 52-year-old Birch and the 21-year-old Mary had a sexual relationship. But around 1820, things finally started to turn around for Mary. She found a 20-foot ichthyosaur and a couple additional smaller ones over the following year. Then, in 1823-1824, she made what's considered her most famous find. Yeah, she discovered the first intact plesiosaurus skeleton. This animal had never been seen before. It was also a marine animal, but totally different from an ichthyosaurus. The plesiosaur had a long neck and a fat body and looked more like a lizard than a fish. British geologist William Buckland described it thus. He said, quote, To the head of the lizard it united the teeth of the crocodile, a neck of enormous length resembling the body of a serpent, a trunk and tail having the proportions of an ordinary quadruped, and the ribs of a chameleon and the paddles of a whale. So it sounds like quite a creature, and she sold the skeleton to the Duke of Buckingham for 200 pounds, and it was really so weird-looking that some people, including the renowned French zoologist Georges Cuvier, doubted it was real. Cuvier thought that Mary had faked the whole thing, but upon further study, he realized it was, in fact, a real specimen, and after Cuvier authenticated the find, many people started to take Mary's fossil findings a little more seriously. You know, this lady actually knew what was going on. And she did continue to make discoveries, too. In December 1828, she found the fossil of a flying reptile. It was a raven-sized skeleton that, according to some sources, represented the first evidence of a prehistoric winged creature, even though, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, it was the pterosaur specimen found first outside of Germany. So the, yeah. the first one found somewhere besides Germany. So Buckland bought the skeleton from Mary and gave it the name Pterodactylus macronix, meaning winged fingers. And just a year later in 1829, Mary found the skeleton of a fish-like creature called a squalorija, which many, many believed was an evolutionary intermediary between sharks and rays. 
So ultimately, with all these fossils coming up in her hands, Mary became something of a local celebrity. She was called the Fossil Woman and the Princess of Paleontology, a nickname given to her by a German scientist. And she really put her hometown on the map, too, for the scientific community. People had known that this area was rich in fossils before, but Mary's discoveries started to attract scientists who wanted to work with her. A really big deal, because at the time, women in science were still pretty rare, so she'd go on on fossil hunting expeditions with famous scientists like Buckland and paleontologist Richard Owen, who's credited with coining the term dinosauria in 1842. So um, getting out there with the major players in the field at the time. And though Mary lacked any sort of formal scientific training, she managed to impress these rather impressive science guys, not just because of her knowledge of the local area in which she was fossil hunting, but she seemed to understand the anatomy of the creatures that she was excavating and would even argue with established researchers on certain points. Non-scientists would often come just to check Mary out, too, because she was kind of a character. Some described her as a, quote, prim, pedantic, vinegar-looking, thin female— and others described her as a, quote, strong, energetic spinster, still others as a, quote, clever, funny creature. So she herself was kind of a curiosity. For better or worse, it sounds. So unfortunately, though, Mary often didn't get credit for these fossil finds. And this was partly because many scientists didn't give her credit in books and papers they published on her discoveries. And then partly because her role in the whole fossil collecting business was in the trade aspect of it. She wasn't writing the papers. She wasn't holding them in collections. And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, it was the collection who would donate these specimens to institutions like museums and who would usually get credited with their discovery. A few scientists did give her credit in their work, but not as many as should have. According to that British Heritage article we mentioned earlier, she knew that, too. Apparently, a friend once said, quote, She says the world has used her ill. These men of learning have sucked her brains and made a great deal by publishing works of which she furnished the contents while she derived none of the advantages. She was even denied admission to the Geological Society of London despite her accomplishments because they didn't allow women in the organization at that time, though they finally made her an honorary member, not an official member, but an honorary member in 1847. She didn't let any of that resentment stop her from practicing her trade, though, right up until the end. According to a profile on Mary Anning by Alex K. Rich, she bought a house for herself and her mother, and they ran a store out of it from which they sold fossils, and they called the whole thing the Fossil Depot, which is rather charming. Mary died of breast cancer on March 9th, 1847, and to commemorate her achievements, the townspeople installed a stained glass window depicting her image in the town's church and a plaque, too, near the cliffs where she had first discovered that original ichthyosaur. And of course, you can still see her finds around. The head of the first ichthyosaurus she discovered can be found, I think, I believe it can still be found in the Natural History Museum in London. And there's another way that you may have unwittingly remembered her throughout the years of your life. Mary may have been the inspiration for the well-known tongue twister. She sells seashells by the seashore. So if you sort of remember back to the beginning of the podcast when we were talking about how she used to try to sell those shells to tourists, those fossilized shells. That's where that could have come from. And it was written by English songwriter Terry Sullivan in 1908 and actually goes something like this. I'm going to say it really slow because (laughs) it is a tongue twister after all. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. For if she sells seashells on the seashore, then I'm sure she sells seashore shells. Well done, Davina. <laughs> Almost. I kind of fell apart there at the end. I but. was I was testing this out before we went into recording, and I was thinking, like, you know the she sells seashells by the seashore, because mm-hmm. you probably have been practicing that one. I mean, not practicing, like getting ready for this moment. But, <laughs> you know, you've known it since your early fossil hunting days. Right. You kind of get the cadence of it. But and, when you get these yeah. other ones thrown in, it's sort of <laughs> oh my gosh. sort of a shocker. Yeah. I'm I'm imagining that our um our listeners who listen to the podcast to practice their English are probably wondering what on earth has happened right now. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I don't know how ubiquitous these tongue twisters are, <laughs> but um yeah, for novice English speakers maybe it's the ultimate maybe wait a while before <laughs> you try to tackle this one. It's tough. 
So anyway, I thought that would be a fun way to kind of end off this podcast about Mary Anning um, with this tongue twister that I didn't even realize there was an inspiration for it. I thought people just kind of pulled these things out of the air. I know. Is there a Peter Piper, too, out a there? A woodchuck one. <laughs> <know>, a woodchuck, <laughs> a rubber baby buggy bumper. I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm going to have to go start Googling tongue twisters now and find out if there it could be a series. stories behind them. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday Classic. Since this is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar during the course of the show, that may be obsolete now. So here is our current contact information. We are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com, and then we're at Missed in History all over social media. That is our name on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 